Good morning. Welcome to uh, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board Committee meetings. It is now 9.06. Um, my name is Fred Fadias, and I'm chairman of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, before we call this meeting to order, uh, I would like to make a few announcements. One is I would like to congratulate our member of the Coordinating Board, Mr. Ricky Raven, uh, for his service. He was appointed by Governor Greg Abbott uh, yesterday to the University of Houston Board of Regents. Uh, so congratulations, Ricky. There he is online. We are very proud of you and look forward to continuing to work for the Coordinating Board and your new position. Would you like to say a few words, Ricky? Yeah, well, thank you. Good morning uh, to everyone. I, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, we can. Um, I'm, I'm excited about uh, serving the University of Houston. I, uh, it is, of course, my alma mater, and uh, that's always a great thing. But um, for my dis uh, service on the coordinating board, it has really been my pleasure, my honor, and my privilege to serve with all of you. Uh, what we're doing is uh, critically important to the future of our state, and in many instances to this nation. And so um, it has been great for me to learn all the different uh, things that are uh, relevant to education, to higher education. Um, and I am, uh, I'm just uh, so excited about this opportunity and I, I wish every one of you the best of luck. And, uh, um, you know, although I'm, I'm glad to be uh, moving on to the University of Houston, I'm really sad about leaving the coordinating board because it's a, it's a group of extraordinary people who do extraordinary work every day. And um, um, it's been my pleasure to work with each and every one of you. And uh, uh, if I can ever be of any further assistance, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, but uh, uh, thank you for, um, uh, thank you for these, I guess it's been six years now, how time flies when you're having fun, right? Uh, right. So uh, I, um, I thank you all for, for your friendship and, and, and uh, working, being able to work with you. Well, thank you, uh, Ricky. Um, Mr. Raven, as you mentioned, has been on the board uh, for, for a few years, and we are going to recognize him with a nice certificate uh, coming up in the future here. So thank you, Ricky, for your service uh, to the Coordinating Board, Higher Education in the State of Texas. We do appreciate that. I know we'll be working together in higher education issues as, as we all move forward. So thank you. Uh, we thank have you. two new appointees uh, to the Coordinating Board, and I'll formally introduce them at our board meeting. Uh, tomorrow, but just uh, doc, uh, first, Robert Gaunt. Robert is right here, the left, and Mr. Rick Clemmer. Where is Rick? There he is, right next to Robert. Welcome, gentlemen, uh, to the coordinating board. We welcome you, and uh, uh, feel free to ask questions as we discussed in our orientation yesterday. Uh, it'll be a great learning experience, and we'll announce uh, tomorrow more detail about your appointment. But we welcome you. We welcome your expertise and participation in the improvement of higher education for the great state of Texas. So. Uh, Governor Abbott appointed them earlier, uh, September 13th, 2021, and uh, they both um, are ready to roll. Uh, we had a long orientation yesterday, half a day, and, and they were they had great questions. And uh, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. We had all uh, the commissioner and his leadership team there, uh, so it's it's great to have new people with great expertise uh, on our board. So welcome, gentlemen. Okay, now I would also uh, like to pass the gavel over to Mr. Welcome Wilson to officially call the meeting, uh, committee meeting of innovation, uh, data, and educational analytics to order. Mr. Wilson. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the time is uh, 9.10. Uh, good morning. My name is Welcome Wilson, Jr., and I'm acting as the chair of the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics. Uh, I would like to call this meeting to order October 20th, 2021, uh, for the Committee on Innovation Data, Education Analytics. Uh, this meeting is being held via live broadcast. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome those joining us via video conference and ask that they observe the following etiquette. Uh, please state your name before you speak, mute your phone when not speaking, and please keep background noise to a minimum. 
Uh, members, when I call your name, uh, please announce uh, present, if you would. Uh, welcome, Wilson, Jr., Vice Chair, Fred Farias. Here. Ricky Raven. Present. Uh, Ricky, I see you're already wearing your red shirt, so you're, you, 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 you didn't miss a beat in, uh, in uh, catching the wave. Well, I tell you, you've got to get on board as quickly as you can before the train leaves the station. Welcome. <laughs> Yeah, if you're not wearing the red, the uh, um, chancellor will write you up. Uh, That's so. exactly right. I don't want to get in the penalty box early. Yeah. Uh, Sam Torn? Present. Thank you, Sam. Donna Williams? Present. Uh, Matthew Smith, student representative, ex officio? Present. Great. Please record in the minutes that we have a quorum. Uh, members, I'd like to welcome uh, Rick Klimmer and Robert Gaunt. Uh, the, uh, uh, the good news is that, that we are surrounded by very intelligent, talented uh, uh, administration and staff here. So it's not as scary as it might appear on the front end. We have a lot of great people uh, that do a lot of good, great work supporting all of us. So it makes our job easy. Uh, Chairman would like to officially announce them tomorrow and just wanted to acknowledge them today. Agenda item two is consideration of the approval of the minutes from the July 21st, 2021 committee meeting. Uh, members, do I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? So moved, Ricky Raven. Second. Yeah, moved by Ricky. Do I have a second? A second, second by Fred Farias. Any discussion? Uh, members in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, hearing none, the motion passes. Agenda item number three is public testimony on agenda items relating to the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics. Do we have anyone uh, registered to testify? Uh, we do not. If so, we'll go on to the next item, number four. It's consideration and approval of the consent calendar. The consent calendar includes items that can be approved without comment or discussion. This allows us to save time for other items that we need more attention. Our consent items are highlighted in gray on the agenda. Of course, any board member can request that a consent item agenda be added to or removed from the consent calendar. Members, the following items are on the consent calendar for consideration. Item 5D, consideration of approving replacement of a member on the General Academic Institutions Formula Funding Advisory Committee and a member of the Health Related Institutions Formula Funding Advisory Committee for the 2024-25 biennium. Agenda item 5E, review of facilities projects submitted to the coordinating board pursuant to Texas Education Code section 61.0572 and 61.058. Agenda item 5G, consideration of approving the appointment of members of the Financial Aid Advisory Committee. Does anyone have want to remove any of these items from the consent agenda? Are there any other agenda items that anyone would want to add to the consent calendar? If not, members, is there a motion to approve the consent items, please? So moved. Thank you, Donna. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Uh, those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Uh, hearing none, the motion passes. We'll move on to agenda item 5A, 60 by 30 text data insight preliminary headcount for fall 2021. Ms. Laurie Fay. Will a Deputy Commissioner of Data Analytics and Innovation will provide a presentation and be available to answer questions. Uh, this item is for information only. Laurie? Thank you. And good morning, members. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. It's very nice to see you, and I'm here today to uh, share an update on preliminary headcount. Uh, this data is collected from all of our institutions uh, annually, each fall, including our independent colleges and universities, and gives us a, a, a preliminary view of enrollment. The data, this data has been especially important as we've monitored the impact of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic on our institutions and our students. And while this uh, presentation is normally uh, covers two years of data, we've chosen this time to provide three years to better illustrate the impact of what's happened to our institutions since 2019. Next slide, please. 
Just a little background on this particular collection. This is uh, something that we've done every fall for decades and provides some of the initial insight into what's happening with our enrollment patterns. As you can see here on the slide, the, the institutions that, um, that participate, we did have 100% uh, participation again this year, and so we're grateful to our institution partners for continuing to provide us this insight into the historic disruptive changes that have, uh, that have come our way since, uh, since the pandemic. Next slide. Here are a few key takeaways from the data. Um, first, uh, the good, first, a bit of good news, the statewide enrollments are relatively stable in most of our, uh, what we refer to as our sectors, with the exception of two-year institutions. Our statewide enrollment decreased less than 1% uh, from fall of 2020 to fall of 2021, and all of our sectors are up in enrollment other than uh, two-year colleges. And we'll talk a bit about, more about that in, uh, in, the, in the coming slides. The disaggregated data, disaggregated by demographic and gender, does show declines for most groups, our, and in particular our largest student populations. And there are some interesting patterns in uh, the male and female enrollment that we'll uh, talk a bit more about later. And then finally, the enrollment patterns do vary pretty significantly by region and by type of institution. So we'll be, uh, I'll be showing you some additional data around, uh, around that. Next slide, please. This provides, this shows you graphically uh, what's actually happened since 2019. So the far left is 2019 uh, enrollment prior to the pandemic, fall of 2020 in the middle, and uh, fall of 2021 there on the right. For uh, four, what, what, again, what we call sectors of institutions, public universities in blue, public two-year colleges in red, uh, green are the, our health-related institutions, and then our independent colleges and universities in yellow. While it's difficult to see this on the graph, uh, the, the two-year total enrollment for our public two-year institutions actually fell below that of our public four-year institutions for the first time since the 90s. Uh, it's very small, uh, it's about 2,000 students, but again, um, a, meaningful, a meaningful change for those particular institutions. All other sectors, as I said, are up. Uh, the independent colleges are up just a little over a percent from 2019. Our public four years are up nearly 2% from 2019. And then uh, HR, our, uh, our health-related institutions, HRIs, are up more than 9%. So significant amount of um, enrollment growth in that, in that sector. Next slide, please. This gives you sort of the long view of, uh, of enrollment between two-year and four-year. And as you can see, this goes back to, 20, uh, to the year 2000. So this slide was not included in your packet because uh, we added it after printing. But as again, you can see the fluctuation in community college enrollment. And uh, the enrollment levels that, we, that, that our, our two-year institutions are experiencing today is about uh, the same level as in 2010 as we were coming out of 2010-2011 uh, as we were coming out of the 2009 recession. So it's, very, um, it's, it's a very interesting trend to see. Next slide. And this slide is for reference, really. Uh, these are the numbers behind the graphs. And as you can see, uh, all of our sectors are either remaining stable or are recovering with the exception of our two-year institutions. That, uh, that decline equates to about 80,000 students, so meaningful, uh, a meaningful percentage. Next slide. Could, could I call out just a couple of sure. points, just to underline a couple of points for the for the board and for the, and for the general audience? So, so um, if you back up to the to the chart, um, so so this there are a couple of things that are particularly striking about the uh, about what we're seeing in enrollments that I'd like to call out. So, early on when we were um, when we were first experiencing the the shock of the pandemic and unemployment was spiking. So the, the expectation was that we might see in, uh, enrollments in community colleges increase. So historically, like if you, if you think about the chart that, we, that, that, uh, that Lori showed when we saw that, that spike in enrollment for the community colleges, that correlated with the Great Recession. 
So generally when we see an employment goes up, uh, we also see enrollment uh, goes up, particularly in community colleges. Now in, in this case, uh, during the, the pandemic, as institutions were scrambling to move their offerings to online offerings, there were a number of colleges that expected to see a surge of enrollment, not just because enrollment was going up, uh, or not just because unemployment was going up, but also uh, the, the expectation was, well, as the, as the offerings are shifting to online, we might see students opting for lower cost institutions and uh, sort of voting with their feet to say, well, if I'm gonna be online anyway, then maybe I'd rather pay community college tuition uh, than university t uh, tuition. That didn't happen. And in fact, what did happen is, um, is, 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 uh, is striking. The, the university enrollments continue to increase. So I commend the universities for continuing to increase their, their enrollments. TSTCs initially took a tremendous blow on their enrollments, but then they uh, pivoted and recovered quickly, astoundingly quickly, so that we have nearly 5,000 additional enrollments in the TSTCs. If you pull those TSTCs out, the decline in the community college enrollment is closer to 11.5%. And we see this, it, so there's variance across the state, as Lori mentioned, there's variance across different regions. There's some of our community colleges, even very large ones like Lone Star, were relatively stable. But we saw many, many community colleges across the state see uh, stunning drops in their enrollment of more than 10%, and that has not, so that's not recovered. So they were, so right now the preliminary fall enrollments, uh, they're looking better, but if you look back to where they were in 2019, that's where we still see that, that, that it's been this uh, astounding drop in, in enrollment overall. And so that's, that's something that we need, we're gonna need to uh, pay careful attention to, um, especially in this interim, um, as, as uh, uh, the, many of the board members know, we're about to kick off um, a commission on community college finance to talk about how we can better align the finance commission, uh, the finance uh, system for community colleges with the goals of the state. This, um, these enrollment patterns are gonna be high on the, on the uh, list for discussion. So Commissioner and Lori, then that brings the question, why? Uh, and who is studying that and how do we get to the analysis of how do we correct that? That's kind of the question that comes to mind, obviously. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so we have so we've got some anecdotal information from, from colleges, but everyone is scrambling within the colleges and um, uh, within Texas. It also, this isn't just a Texas phenomenon. We're right. seeing this across a number of states where community college enrollments are down. If you pull out, now if you pull out dual credit um, enrollments, Community college enrollments have been have been declining steadily for the last decade. So where we've seen the growth, the net growth in community colleges on average, has been in dual credit. We did so part of this drop was because we did see a significant drop in dual credit enrollments. Uh, that was about eight percent drop in dual credit enrollments during the uh, pandemic. But that doesn't explain all of what's going on. To your point, Mr. Chairman. I think child care is a big issue. <laughs> Child care, sorry, is that on? Can you hear me? Okay. Child care is there. a big issue. I know a lot of daycares closed down during the pandemic, and, and so there just isn't the child care availability that some you know, student mothers need. I think that's been a big factor in El Paso. Were we finding that some of the, uh, many of the two-year institutions weren't able to do the on, uh, get up to speed on online? as quickly as some of the four-year institutions? Do you think that's a factor? We, well? don't, we don't have any insight of, uh, that would lead us to that conclusion. I think it's the, sort of the combination that the commissioner's pointing to. Dual credit is a meaningful percentage of a lot of two-year institutions' enrollments, mm -hmm. and that fell off pretty dramatically. And, uh, and then there are some other phenomenons that, I, Dr. Prius, I agree with you, we need to take a closer look at to really understand what's happening and what, uh, what how the, how students are connecting with programs and, therefore, and then following on to connect with jobs in their, in their area or in their area of interest. So I think it's, it, it, we will learn some interesting things as we take a closer look over this next year as a, as a function of the commission's work. And I can see how the, uh, the smaller community colleges, that's 
that reduction is a huge impact on their budget because they just don't have the wherewithal uh, to, you know, provide the depth of counseling and everything else on a good day. And I can see where that would. Uh, and the childcare thing is very interesting. I, I don't know if there's a best practices model somewhere that we could study to share where, you know, maybe there's some sort of child care assistance on campus or something uh, to do it because. Uh, we have seen some of the campuses, um, both for the broad access universities and for the community colleges, um, uh, set up child care, also set up food pantries and other kinds of support structures. Um, but it, but to your point, Mr. Wilson, that it tends to be the larger colleges, the better resource colleges that are able to, to stand up more of those wraparound supports. So for smaller colleges that were already um, just getting by, uh, to see this drop of en enrollment, that's, that's got a significant impact. And, and the, way that our, the way our funding system works is we're the, just to refer, um, uh, for, for some of the new board members, the, the funding system for community colleges and for general academics in general, it doesn't keep pace with current enrollments. It's based on a snapshot of a base year looking in the rearview mirror. So, uh, so when there's a drop in enrollment, that, can, that ripples through to, and impacts your appropriation for the next two years. The, the legislature did not provide a hold harmless for the community colleges that had a drop in enrollment. They did provide some targeted uh, sort of one-time um, uh, in investments for 11 community colleges, but still on the formula side, there were about half the community colleges lost funding uh, in their formula uh, this, the, in the budget that went to the floor in, in this last regular session. So, th so then you just don't have the resources at the colleges to provide those kind of more robust wraparound supports or child care or other, other kind of supports for, uh, for the students. Yeah, because I can see where if it's looking at the rearview mirror, your enrollment goes down, your funding goes down, now you don't have the resources to help grow your enrollment back, and so therefore you're, you know, it's hard to catch up. You're playing catch up. I had um, a couple of meetings with the community college presidents this month, and exactly what you're describing, uh, Mr. Wilson and the commissioner, it's resources uh, and it's challenges and it's time to play catch up. Uh, so it, it is a challenge for the community colleges and so that kind of ties in together. But then the question is, you know, why did the students come back? Going back to the original question. But for childcare, uh, Ms. Schwartz, I know in business and hospitals, uh, they have established internally uh, for their uh, staff employees uh, those benefits, but it goes back to resources. Those hospital companies and big corporations have the opportunity to do that. And so that's how they kind of got through it. But not everybody at the size that Mr. Wilson points out is able to do that uh, in higher education in the state. And unfortunately, a lot of these smaller community colleges are in rural areas mm -hmm. to where there's no other alternatives. I mean, you know, some students will drive 100 miles to go. I mean, so it's, it's really, uh, uh, I would think, I don't know if it's, Impacting the rural areas. Yeah, you'll harder. see that when we look at the when we look at the graphs by region. Yeah, it's it's very it's varied. If I could add something real quick, I think part of what might be contributing to it, just from a sort of student perspective, is one of the reasons why a lot of students go to. I can't speak for the entire downtrend. It seems like there's been a bit of a uh, decline in enrollment in community colleges for a while now. That might have something to do with just a rise in e in the economy for a minute. Where more students could afford with a little bit more, a little bit less aid than normal to go to a full four year. Uh, however, I, I think what could be causing it is there's less students now who have to take in account to account the cost of living of moving to the city where that university is. So, for example, uh, if you live in a small rural town and it costs you know close to a thousand dollars a month for rent for student housing. And now, during the pandemic, you can enroll online at a full four-year uni your university. You have the grades to transfer, or you have the grades just to enroll there straight away, but you're going to be online now. That cuts down costs significantly for a lot of students to go to a four-year university. So I wouldn't be surprised if the reason why there's a slight uptick in four years, but not in uh, community colleges, is most students found it more affordable to attend online. That's a really interesting point. It, it might be just point. sort of anecdotal perspective, but that's yeah. an observation I have. Seems to be going back to resources, Commissioner, as you say. Yeah. yeah. 
So I've got a question. How much of yes, these, um, it seems to me that two-year college enrollment might have more students who are also self-supporting or supporting families. Um, during the pandemic, that might have become more difficult. Uh, Post-pandemic, it still might be more difficult or uh, they might see that they're able to earn uh, what they need to earn and so they don't see the benefit of a any sort of educational certificate. So do we have any statistics on uh, what people who go to two-year colleges, what they do, whether those uh, the pandemic affected their economic status that either prevented them from coming or made them not feel the necessity to come? So we, we don't have direct statistics um, for the colleges. Um, some of the, so what, what I heard from a number of the colleges is that they did see a drop off, especially in students returning. So they saw some drop off in direct college enrollments. Those sound like they're better this fall, but they saw, an, they, they did see a lot of drop off in students returning. Uh, so uh, to your point, Mr. Torn, I, I, I think that, uh, that there were some significant um, um, uh, financial reasons that folks would do that. So you, we do see, for example, a bump in the uh, labor market per participation for 16 to 19 year olds. And so, uh, so uh, uh, normally we would think of labor market participation as a good thing, um, but a lot of the a, a lot of that participation is in entry level jobs that have limited uh, mobility. So it seems like that there were a lot of folks that felt like um, that they would maybe put off going back to school or enrolling in school um, uh, because they felt the need to work. Uh, but where this, from from the from our perspective in uh, around higher education, this this could create a vulnerability because the longer folks are out, the lower the chances are that they're going to re-enroll. Um, so so we're going to need to partner with the colleges. Uh, closely, uh, especially over this next year, to help them re-engage and re-enroll uh, some of those folks who stopped out or dropped out. Ready to move on? You want to next, carry on? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Next slide. So we're also seeing, and this uh, gets to some of the points you all were making, we're also seeing enrollment impacts uh, in different demographic groups. So this chart here gives you a view of uh, some of, of the populations that we monitor. As you know, as part of the strategic plan for higher education, we disaggregate our data and pay close attention to the various student populations. And uh, in this case, all of our major student populations, our largest student population groups have declined uh, over the last Three, uh, over the la over the two years of the pandemic, the exception to that is uh, our a group of uh, this one of our smaller population groups, Pacific uh, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American, and other groups make up the red bar, which has had a slight increase. But as you can see, the other our other groups, our uh, Hispanic and Black students and our white students, have all experienced declines since 2019. No surprise, right? I mean, every. Things, the trends are uh, are down, but this is of of additional concern because these are populations that uh, you know we we pay close attention to, and we want to be sure, particularly for our African American and, and Hispanic students, that enrollments are staying strong and keeping pace with the growth of the demographic in our statewide population. Next slide. And this gets to some of the conversation and uh, p potentially some of the causes that uh, Ms. Schwartz was pointing to. Our male and female enrollment patterns are quite different. So here you can see on the left, male enrollment dropped from 2019 to 2020 and then has rebounded some in, uh, in 2021. Again, it's still falling short of 2019 levels by about 24,000 students, uh, male students, but, but it is on, you know, the, the trend has reversed, we hope. Uh, the, the story is not the same for our female students. That's continued to, to the, the enrollment for female students has continued to decline, um, and it may be for some of the reasons that you all were discussing, uh, child care, uh, work responsibilities, family responsibilities, uh, budgets stretched thin. Uh, that, that decline is down, for female students, is down about 4.5% from 20. 19, and that's about 40,000 students. 
So uh, whereas the male decline is uh, about 24,000 students, the female decline is about 40,000. So again, something that we need to pay, be paying close attention to and talking about with uh, our institutions. Next slide, please. And this starts to get at some of the, uh, of the, uh, the regional variation uh, that we're seeing. So two-year institutions uh, across the board have experienced declines, and you see that reflected in, this is the two-year uh, two year institutions uh, but over the two years of the pandemic. So you can see the, the, the declines in enrollment range from a low of 3.5% in West Texas, which is one of our more rural areas, to, uh, you know, 14, 15% in our metro, in, in two of our major metros, as well as in uh, Upper Rio Grande, which encompasses the El Paso region. So that impact in uh, enrollment in two-year institution enrollment is felt in uh, across the across the state. Next slide. So while enrollment decreased, uh, while enrollment decreased for all regions in 2020, some regions uh, are experiencing a, a bit of a comeback. And this slide depicts that. So you can see there's a range. Uh, this is the 20 to 20, 2020 to 2021 enrollment on, uh, at the regional level. And you can see that some of them have either stayed relatively stable, so you can see very small percentages, you know, uh, less than 2% uh, up or down in many of the regions. But some are still, and, and some are uh, in the positive, which is, which is good news. Uh, can I get a quick point of clarification real quick? Uh, when we're talking about enrollments, do you mean enrollments by the citizens coming from those areas, like Texas people graduating and then going to universities, or do you mean enrollment in the universities in that area? No, this is enrollment based on the location of the of the institution. Okay. Yeah, right. not the location of the student. Got yep. It. Next slide. And these are the numbers that are behind those graphs. And as you can see, uh, the variation is, uh, is significant. And we see the largest declines in our major metros, those being Central Texas, Gulf Coast, which includes Houston and the surrounding counties, uh, DFW, and then South Texas, which is the Rio Grande Valley. These regions, those, those particular regions account for about 85% of the decrease in the enrollment statewide. So those are some of our, some of our largest institutions and in uh, the areas of the state where there are the most institutions are experiencing the greatest declines. Next slide. And this gets to the point we were, uh, the discussion we were having about the variation in, uh, by institution. And so these graphs, each of these, uh, each of these lines represents an institution's percentage change in enrollment. And you can see on the left-hand side are public and state colleges that vary from uh, uh, over, this, over these two years from a minus 28% to the commissioner's point, significant declines, to a plus 12% over this two-year period. And all but four of the public community and state colleges have experienced declines in enrollment since 2019. Now, on the good news side of that, 17 of them had increases from 2020 to 2021. So some are making, uh, are making adjustments. The four-year graph on the right, as you can see, uh, it tells a different story. The, there are fewer institutions that have experienced enrollment declines. Those tend to be some of our smaller, uh, more rurally located four-year institutions. Uh, but some of those declines are significant. 17%. And then on the upside, you see 24 out of 37 of our public and four-year institutions have experienced increases. Fai, I have a question, Ms. Fai. On the previous slide, regional enrollments showed by varied trends. You said the Rio Grande Valley is included in South Texas. Then how would you distinguish Upper Rio Grande? What part of the state are you calling that? The, the slide prior to this one? Can we go back to the map slide? Yeah. Uh, there you down. go. So oh, Upper Rio Grande, yeah. There you go. Got it. So okay. Not quite Laredo. I don't know. Right. It's pretty close. Towards my Texas geography, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Little, maybe failing me, but. Got it. No, I saw the slide there. Thank yeah. you. It's El Paso, Hudson County, um, that area. It doesn't go down to Laredo. Yeah. It's not quite yeah. as far. So it's kind of, yeah, just maybe the map's off a little bit. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Next slide. Um, I did want to chime in also on, uh, we did see the sharpest decline at Texas Southern University, uh, and, uh, you know, the, there's new leadership at Texas Southern University. 
um, the, the board uh, leadership had an opportunity to engage uh, with them. They're, they've um, they have seen uh, their enrollment come up by about 500 students, but they had initially seen a drop in enrollment that was more than 20 percent. They're still they're still off significantly from uh, uh, where they were in 2019. Um, but uh, uh, to Lori's point, we saw um, more of more of the drops at four-year institutions were at institutions like A and M Kingsville or uh, Sol Ross. Wow. Uh, some of those uh, more broad access and also more rural institutions. Okay. So next slide. So we will be uh, getting certified enrollment data in December and we'll have that available in uh, January. This, this preliminary headcount is an early look. It tends to be a, a less than 2% difference between the preliminary and the actual certified. And so it does give us a good leading indicator. Uh, and uh, as you know, we'll be, in, we'll be rippling through the measures that we monitor on, on, as, a, as part of the state's strategic plan for higher education, 60 by 30 Texas. And so we will be continuing to keep a close eye on these, uh, on these numbers as, as uh, we see the impact and experience of students as they continue their educational journeys. That, with that, I'm, uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any additional questions. So are we sharing this study with legislators and others, or what's the plan to? Yes, this data will be, the, the, both the presentation and then the data that underlies the presentation will both be posted on the website, and the commissioner uh, can speak to our plan to share it more broadly. You know, and we have informally already, already shared some of the data. That there, this is uh, one of the more common requests from the legislative offices that they're tracking enrollments. And, um, and I, again, I, I think especially um, what we're seeing in community college enrollments are going to be uh, high on the agenda for the work of this uh, interim commission on community college finance. Great. So, Ms. Fye, I have a question that I was asked by a president of a community college. Uh, do the community colleges have access to the data that we have here at the coordinating board to see uh, the students that may not be enrolled within a region by age? The did the, the, their previously enrolled students? Right. They, we provide, we can, can and do provide back some summary statistics. We've found over the years in um, working with, with our institutions that the, uh, the information that we have that uh, in terms of, that would enable them to reach out to students is generally very outdated and they have the, they have the, uh, the better information. We're currently working with uh, a group of Houston institutions uh, uh, to understand how to better equip institutions to reach out to previously enrolled students who have stopped out or uh, for, for one reason or another. That's, uh, that's a program under the Grad Techs Initiative, and the commissioner probably has more to say about that. Yeah, but that's, uh, um, one of the things that, uh, that, that we're learning and working on with the institutions is um, so where historically uh, uh, the, the assumption was that individual institutions needed to find and re-enroll students. Um, um, uh, most of the time uh, students um, will enroll at a different institution. And so, um, so it, we, we are working with the Houston area um, organizations on more of sort of a comprehensive regional approach to help students understand here the options that are available. Um, so even if they're uh, going to re-enroll at a different institution where they've got exposure to that. So we're working with the, uh, with the pilot uh, institutions in the Grad Techs Initiative for what will eventually become the My Texas Future uh, portal for adult students so they can see the full range of opportunities that are available across colleges. Okay, I think that'd be great. Yeah, those opportunities for them to see that. Thank you. It's fine. Great. Uh, any other questions on this item? Uh, again, this item was for information only, uh, so we will move on to agenda item 5B, is an update on data modernization initiative. Uh, Ms. Lori Fay, will, Deputy Commissioner of Data Analytics and Innovation, will provide a presentation and be available to answer questions. And again, this item is for information only as well. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, uh, and as has, has become our practice, this is a quarterly update on the status of this significant initiative established by the commissioner when he, uh, when he arrived here. Next slide. 
as a reminder, this is one, this, the, uh, the vision that we set out to accomplish is really to uh, move in the direction of providing actionable intelligence and decision support for our stakeholders, both internal and external. And that's the anchor, uh, that's the anchor for, this, for this initiative, which has many moving parts. The goals are, uh, are depicted here. This is, may particularly be of interest to our newer board members. And then across the bottom, you can see that we have been engaged in this process uh, for a little more than a year, actually, and we are now uh, deeply into implementation of this initiative. Next slide. This gives you a bit more of uh, context for the timeline. The, uh, and we are, as I said, we spent about nine months in the planning process and have been in the implementation since earlier this year. These, uh, we, have, we have actually now uh, 14 or 15 of 19 specific technical projects that are, uh, that are underway right now. And we've got a, a dual focus on both building the back-end pipeline and developing public-facing uh, product, data products and services so that we're delivering value as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, next slide. This one is really for reference, but I do like to uh, provide you with an update on some of the highlights of work that's been accomplished the work that we're, we currently have underway, and then the work that's on the near-term horizon. A couple of things I'll point out about the work in progress right now. We are preparing to launch our first, uh, in internally launch our first uh, data product from the new, what will become the new public portal. We're very excited about that. I'm going to give you a glimpse of that on the next slide. We're very excited about our, uh, an opportunity to begin to turn those on for our internal team and get uh, initial feedback. These are interactive dashboards, data that the agency has not provided in this format before. We're very excited about that. Um, we've also launched, as you know, there, there are sort of three major work streams, technical and data architecture is where we spend a, a significant amount of our time, but equally important are, are, uh, are, is our focus on data governance and then on our ability to actually turn data back um, in useful and meaningful ways for our users, which, we, uh, which we're tackling under the communications work stream. So over the last uh, couple of months, we've launched data governance work also with our tri-agency partners, so with, um, with our colleagues at Texas Education Agency and Texas Workforce Commission. We're undertaking a review of the way that we uh, cooperatively govern shared data assets, which is very exciting. Uh, in fact, I have a work session this afternoon with that, with that group uh, that where we'll be talking through the opportunity to strengthen our processes so that we can make data increasingly available to our stakeholders. And then we, uh, as another very exciting milestone that we'll be hitting in the communications work stream later this year, we will be relaunching the agency's website and shortly thereafter the agency's data site. So really an effort to make our data more user friendly and easier to navigate, uh, something that we're all very excited about. And on the next slide... Thank you for that. Yes, <laughs> we know, yes, we are all quite anxiously awaiting. This, this is just a, a quick snapshot of what our initial dashboards will be looking like. So we're really excited about this. This is fake data just for illustrative purposes. But uh, one of the things, Matthew, this was part of your question, one of the things we're actually really excited about doing is being able to provide um, mapped data in ways that give us new information about trends. And so we will be able to provide uh, one of the additions that we've made to, the, to these dashboards is to actually provide enrollment patterns based on county, state, or country of student residents so that institutions can see where their students are actually coming from uh, in new and different ways. And again, these are, these are, you can't really see it very well on the slide. Um, but the, this allows the user to, to, to select all institutions, certain types of institutions, or a specific institution, and then the data will uh, automatically populate for the selection that they've made. Another important component of these, uh, of these dashboards is that you have the ability to download the data that you're looking at, or the graphic. And so we think this will give our uh, internal as well as our external stakeholders significantly more self-service options for actually finding the data they need. So we're very excited about that. And uh, that concludes my next slide. That, that concludes my update, and I'm happy to take any questions. I, I did notice that the uh, area where our chairman resides is, is highlighted in dark green. Is that because you're special, or did I, I, I'm, I'm just saying that was the... 
I just let them do their work. <laughs> That is test data, so we can't draw any conclusions <laughs> from the what, colors on the map for those last ones. I couldn't read ones. What, it was, what, the, you know, what, what that indicated, but I, that's all I can assume. Um, well, this is great because uh, the, the interesting thing, you know, the coordinating board has always historically co collected a phenomenal amount of data. And, and uh, with, the, with the commissioner's leadership, getting that data in usable form and out to all the institutions is really the key. So we have all the data. The question is, what do you do with it? How do you disseminate it right. in a useful manner so that institutions can make informed decisions? So this is great work. So We have a tremendous amount of data available online today, uh, but it's much like Dr. Fradia's uh, comments about our website, not necessarily easy to navigate. And so we're really looking forward to, to being able to turn on some new tools, take advantage of new technology. Uh, to actually make that data significantly easier to find and easier to access and use. Well, I, I would be the low bar test. If, if, <laughs> if I can figure it out, then you're doing a good well, job. Well, we'll sign you up for user <laughs> testing. We're going to be looking for volunteers, Mr. Wilson. So thank you so much. Uh, real, Wait, real any quick. other questions? Uh, I have one question. It's slightly off topic from the data itself. Very excited about that, and it's going to be great. Uh, will this, by any chance, this website relaunch help make it easier to navigate for students who have to pay loans through the website or anything? I don't know quite how the process works. Um, I've noticed that some students, they get flustered and frustrated when they're trying to pay student loans. It doesn't matter what organization. But I'm just wondering if that will affect that at all. I think we're on, that's not specifically in scope for the project that I was talking right, about, right. but we, at, at the, yes, at the, and, and I'll defer to the commissioner, but as one of the commissioners, um, philosophies that undergirds the approach that we're taking on all of these projects is user-centered design. And that is, I don't represent the user of, of, for most of the products and services. And so we, 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 take, we uh, take an, make extra effort to actually use, go to the users who will actually be navigating. And uh, we understand we've got a lot of opportunity to improve on that front, but we are, we are dedicated to being sure that what we're creating actually serves the user's needs, not the agency's needs. Right. Great. Great. Really Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we move on to agenda item 5C as an update on formula funding advisory committees. Ms. Emily Cormier, Assistant Commissioner for Funding, will present this item and be available to answer questions. Good morning, I'm Emily Cormier. This item is a brief update on the work of the three formula funding advisory committees that are meeting this fall. I'll provide a little background on the committees first and then summarize the charges that the commissioner presented to the committees to, for each of the groups to consider. Next slide. So an overview, the coordinating board is required to provide recommendations on the formulas and the funding levels to the Legislative Budget Board or LBB and the Governor's Office in the summer prior to each legislative session. So next summer 2022, we will provide recommendations related to the formulas for the 2024-25 biennium. To produce these recommendations, we use formula advisory committees to receive input from the different institutions of higher education. This process is important because formula funding is the predominant way that the legislature funds our institutions in the state. There's an advisory committee for each of the groups, the general academic institutions, the health-related institutions, and the two-year institutions. And so that includes the community colleges, state colleges, and technical colleges. At your last meeting in July, you approved the membership for each of these committees. Next slide. Here's a brief overview of the timeline of the formula funding recommendations. So the process started this fall with the commissioner providing um, a presentation of the charges for each group to consider, and then the groups meet monthly. In the spring, each committee will send their recommendations to the commissioner, and then those will be brought forward to the board at the April meeting. By June 1st, we must provide recommendations to the governor's office and LBB. And just to note, institutions begin reporting on data that is used in their formula funding allocation for the next 2024-25 biennium starting in the upcoming spring. We provide this preliminary data to the LBB and the governor's office for use in the appropriations process next fall prior to the legislative session. Next slide. So the next few slides are just a listing of the commissioner's charges to each of the committees. So for the general academic institutions, we have a variety of charges relating to the main funding formulas, research, and student success. 
So charges one and two relate to the funding levels for the main formulas that drive appropriations to those institutions, as well as looking at the drivers of each of those formulas. So this will cover topics such as how online courses are treated and how future tuition collections are estimated. Charge three relates to the research funds that the state uses to provide direct financial support to the institutions to further their research goals. And charge four relates to legislation that passed during last session that provided additional financial support for comprehensive regional universities. The coordinating board was asked to study the leg legislation's methodology for providing this additional funding for these institutions to further their work in graduating at-risk students. We've asked the formula advisory committees to help in this review. And the last charge pertains to looking at challenges and opportunities within our financing system to support institutions and graduating students. And we're asking them to review areas that warrant further research and exploration in any of the challenges that exist in the financing, financing system. Next slide. So this slide lays out the charges for our two-year institutions. And as you've just recently heard, this group is in kind of a unique position this year due to the Commission on Community College Finance. So that commission is required to review the financing and policy issues relating to community colleges. So the charges for this advisory committee were kept just on what was legislatively required to focus their attention. And this is predominantly due to the differing timelines. The commission's work is to study these issues over the next year and provide recommendations to the legislature next November, while the formula advisory committee must complete their work this fall. So the first three charges ask for a review of the different formulas and funding levels for each of the two-year institutions, the community colleges, Lamar State Colleges, and the technical colleges. And then charge four and five are legislatively mandated relating to the community college's success point formula, and that's their outcomes-based formula funding model. And this is to look at how critical fields get added or deleted from um, the list of receiving a bonus for graduating students in these areas, and how certain courses and credentials are funded. Moving to the next slide. And finally, for the health-related institutions, or HRIs, the first three charges are relatively standard for the group to consider the funding levels and formulas for this group of institutions, including their formula drivers and how the specific programs are funded. But lastly, the committee is charged with looking at formula funding for the new Doctor Podiatric Medicine Program being established at UTRGV. As you know, this will be the state's first podiatry program, and the advisory group has been asked to consider how it should be funded by the state. So that completes my prepared remarks, and I'm happy to take any questions. So, yes, ma'am. Um, Ms. Cormier, I have a question on, you know, this is an important function of the coordinating board, formula funding, and, and you know, the legislature and uh, institutions look at this very carefully. Two questions, and the, one is, when is the last time we've reviewed the the process, as I understand it, is the institutions recommend their, their folks to be on, to cert on the formula funding committees, correct? Yes, we put out a call for nominations and institutions can submit right. people. Okay, and so um, I guess my point being is that uh, when is the last time we studied the mechanism of how this structure works? Do you know? I don't believe I have information on that. I know it's been in place for quite a long time. Yeah, because my understanding is formula funding, of course, works differently for the technical colleges, right? The community colleges, they're having this special um, area. So it, it seems kind of interesting that we each area seems to have the different mechanisms of funding for higher education in our state. And that's why I asked the question. Maybe the commissioner can give us more insight, especially for the new board members. This is the reason I asked this question, uh, because it's kind of foreign territory. And it, when I first got on the board, it would have been something that I think I would have liked to have known. And and it's it's moving. It's kind of a moving situation. Is that correct, commissioner? Uh, but you, you know, you get my point. I'm just trying to get an explanation of the current structure because it's so important for institutions. It's so important for the funding of our higher education system in the state. Uh, and it, it doesn't seem very consistent. Um, and so for the new members that are on the board and even some that are not quite familiar with it, it's an important thing that we oversee. And I think it's important for us to look at that. So Commissioner, can you give us a little background on that, please? No, that's, a great, that's a great point, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, assist, uh, the, the assistance, many things, consistent is not one of those the, the things. Uh, we, have, we do have several different um, uh, approaches. And so even, and in particular, as, as you alluded to, within our two-year institutions, so we have a fundamentally different approach that we use for the Texas State Technical Colleges 
which is uh, based on a return value model. So uh, the, the state um, funds the uh, TSTCs based on an estimate of the uh, wage premium that's associated with the kinds of credentials that are offered by TSTC. Um, that, that provides um, uh, both an incentive uh, for, for TSTC and also a more uh, direct relationship uh, between the value of the credentials that they award and the funding mechanism. Uh, versus uh, for the community colleges, uh, they're funded on a very traditional contact hour based um, uh, system. And so that, uh, that means that as they innovate their workforce programs or their academic programs, um, and they streamline students' uh, semester credit hours, increase value for the students and for their communities, uh, that may translate into the loss of funding for those community colleges. So that's one of the reasons this is, uh, it's so important uh, to dig into these issues in more depth. Uh, particularly for community colleges, we have, a, as uh, Emily mentioned, there's a ongoing responsibility for uh, the uh, coordinating board through the formula advisory committees to make recommendations to the legislature that then are um, adopted by the board uh, for, uh, for the legislature. Um, but uh, this will be the most in-depth uh, look at community college finance. We are uh, taking advantage of this opportunity uh, to deepen our own capabilities with the coordinating board and in partnership with our higher education institutions uh, to work on uh, issues around uh, uh, higher education finance and in this case particularly community college finance, not just to support the commission but, uh, but beyond. Uh, for the general academic um, uh, institution, so one aside I did want to highlight is that uh, one, uh, Emily mentioned the comprehensive regional universities as being one one place where the universities themselves, spearheaded by the Texas A&M University system, had recommended during the uh, legislative session that the uh, legislature move a little more in the direction of outcomes-based funding with some uh, funding that would be tied to the production of uh, graduates uh, for at-risk students. That bill passed but without funding. Um, but uh, uh, this uh, special session of the legislature, the legislature did allocate uh, $20 million in uh, Senate Bill 8 um, specifically for uh, starting to fund this methodology. And so there'll be an opportunity for the coordinating board to distribute that funding um, in uh, uh, it's consistent with the bill, which is also consistent with the recommendations that the, that, uh, uh, the General Academic Formula Advisory Committee has already made. Um, and so we'll, we will be able to start to take positive steps in that direction of better aligning at least some small portion of the general academic formulas uh, with, with outcomes. There have been several um, efforts over the years to take deeper uh, dives uh, that the agency has worked on in partnership with the general academic uh, institutions. Um, those haven't translated into fundamental reform of the system. So we still have a very traditional um, uh, approach that is primarily based on 12-day class enrollments. Um, so uh, the, uh, we take a snapshot of the 12-day class enrollments and uh, regardless of individual student need, um, regardless of whether students complete those credits or uh, what kind of progress they're making or uh, the value of credentials on the other side, um, we fund based on those, uh, that snapshot of enrollments. So there's, there's uh, certainly a lot of uh, room uh, to uh, continue this work both for the community colleges and for the general academic institutions, especially as we're updating the higher education goals. Um, so we're, uh, so the board, of course, right now is leading important work, as uh, Lori described, on modernizing our data infrastructure, so we're going to have a much more dynamic view of what's going on. Uh, that we're working on updating the higher education goals to better align with what the state needs from higher education. Um, Part of what we're going to run into is that the funding system creates, uh, in some cases, a significant headwind for the institutions in pursuing the, those goals and in advancing uh, the higher education goals of the state and the economic needs of their communities and, and the state as a whole. Yeah, I like the way you, you coordinate that because it basically it all ties in together. Uh, and at some point, um, you know, with our new plan and what we're rolling out, all that has to tie together, and especially the funding part. Uh, so, no, thank you for that um, recap on how the system works now. 
And then we don't always have to do things the way we've always been doing them. Also, as we change our goals and plans, it's good to revisit these issues and see if there are better ways or ways to improve the system. Oh, without a doubt. We, um, I mean, to me, the um, just a, a plan where you're compensated based on seats in the chairs it does not really uh, benefit the students as much. And so any kind of system we can come up with or ideas from other uh, best practices or whatever to where the community colleges get compensated based on a formula funding but some sort of bonus or whatever based on outcomes. I mean, we really need to incentivize uh, them to uh, take the risk uh, and, and hopefully be generate better outcomes uh, yeah. because we, it's it's we, a hard you know it's a hard um, challenge and we don't want to disincentivize the smaller community colleges from certain um, you know curriculum or whatever because it doesn't you know it, it doesn't fit the mold so it's a, it's a tough it's a tough challenge to come up with something that um, it really is and when the coordinating board was first started we did the orientation for our two new members. <laughs> And, and Member Governor Connolly in 1965 uh, created this board, and you all have read this, you know, his preamble and his, and his charge, and it did specifically mention in there to be able to have equity and to be able to have all institutions, uh, including at the time community colleges, uh, four-year colleges, two-year colleges, community colleges, all have opportunities for our state. Uh, so, you know, it seems like since I've been on the board many years now, it seems to um, – I mean, it, it's since we're revisiting our higher ed plan, it, it would be interesting to, you know, work and look at different options. So, uh, but Mr. Wilson, that was well stated. I, I agree that, you know, sometimes we need to look at different options and maybe ways of improving things. And not just specifically for, for funding, but just in overall, like we're doing with the 60 by 30 refresh, which we'll get uh, a good uh, recap of uh, on Thursday, tomorrow. Yeah, I think that's an opportunity since we're studying uh, the refresh, you know, committee. Since we're studying that heavily, we ought to come out of there with some strong recommendations for the legislature to, because uh, really our job to kind of do the front end work and and really give them the uh, all the information they need to make informed decisions. Because everybody really wants the student outcome to be positive. So yeah, and it's all about the students. So. So uh, certainly, uh, it's a good point about uh, needing to benchmark with the schools that are that are more efficient. We do see, we of course, we have tremendous variation across our community colleges. We've got uh, Lone Star in Dallas um, have uh, tens of thousands of students in the seventy thousand uh, range of enrollments, and then we have um, we have very small uh, colleges like uh, Ranger College and Frank Phillips College um, that are that are in more rural areas of the state. Um, so it'll be important both to both to benchmark against where there are more more effective um, uh, uh, approaches to, uh, uh, especially administrative costs, uh, where there might be opportunities to share cross, costs across institutions. That's one of the specific charges of the uh, Community College Finance Commission to explore uh, where there might be uh, potential efficiencies around sort of shared services and shared administrative costs. Um, I, I, and this will also be an opportunity, though, to dig into the issues of what the what the real cost drivers really are. Um, so, on the public school finance side, uh, Texas has over decades um, done uh, uh, has commissioned a number of different um, commissions and studies, and and uh, now, as the role, result of uh, legislation, uh, House Bill Three from a couple of uh, sessions ago has one of the most equitable systems in the country where we make fairly sophisticated adjustments for scale and for student need. Um, so we have not done that same level of uh, in-depth analysis uh, so far around our uh, higher education institutions. So now, particularly for the community colleges, this is going to be an important uh, opportunity for us to do that, and to Mr. Wilson's uh, point, in the context of, the, of these new higher education goals. Great. Any other questions? 
Great. Thank you, Emily. We appreciate it. Um, we'll move on to items 5D and E. Uh, we're approved on the consent calendar, so we'll move on to agenda item 5F. Agenda item 5F is consideration of adopting the report on student financial aid in Texas higher education fiscal year 2020. Dr. Charles Contero Pulls, Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Student Financial Aid Programs, will present this item and be available for any questions. Thank you. Um, while, before I went into the presentation, I just wanted to speak to Mr. Smith's question, just to let you know that our current loan management system contract um, ends in 2023, and we're in the process of going through the procurement process. I'm sorry, we're in the procurement process um, for identifying a new system that in which we seek to significantly enhance the customer service experience. Um, so it's still a couple years away, um, but we are definitely in the process to accomplish that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, in my role as Assistant Commissioner for Student Financial Aid Programs, I am very fortunate to have a great team supporting our efforts. And I want to start by acknowledging the work of Andy Thomas, Rafael Villarreal and Marty Bustos Ford, who are responsible for creating our financial aid reports. Next slide. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the financial aid report, I thought I'd provide a bit of background on this document, which the agency has published since 1993. Um, as you can see on this slide, the report is driven by statutory requirements. Um, and while there are numerous reporting requirements, our goal is to pull them all together in one comprehensive report rather than a patchwork of different documents. Um, when next year's report is created, we will actually be integrating the Texas Grant Report into the financial aid report, uh, which will finally allow us to bring all of the different financial aid reporting into, uh, together into one place. This report serves as a key stakeholder resource. Uh, institutions use it to track activity across sectors and programs. Um, when elected officials have questions about our aid programs, the financial aid report is often the source of the answer. Um, and if researchers contact us about our financial aid programs, the annual financial aid report is the first thing that we provide. Next slide. Before we create the financial aid report, we start with the financial aid database. Texas is fortunate to have an extremely comprehensive reporting system for our financial aid. The annual submissions of every institution participating in our financial aid programs provide a rich history of financial aid activity. In addition to supporting the creation of the financial aid report, the data in the financial aid database is used by external researchers to study financial aid. It supports numerous operational activities, including the annual allocation of financial aid appropriations, the fiscal analysis completed for bills filed during the legislative session, annual performance metrics required for the legislature, and for many other activities. The next slide. The financial aid report fulfills its statutory requirements by performing two primary functions. First, it paints a picture of financial aid activity over the past year. With 65 different charts and figures, we slice and dice financial aid data so that the public can see how students are supported through these programs. These charts and figures break down aid by their source of funding, federal, state, institutional, private, um, by the institution the student attends, by the financial strength of the student's family, by the type of aid, grant, loan, work program, and the list of ways that we parse the data goes on. Next slide. The financial aid report also tells a very important story, which is captured in this image here. Despite over $11 billion, in federal, state, institution, and private financial aid provided to Texas residents, there was still substantial unmet cost for students. In this graph, the yellow section, or the section at the very top of the bar, 
represents the portion of the average cost of attendance that is not covered by financial aid. <laughs> Students and their families tackle this unmet cost in different ways. For some, their family resources can cover the cost of education that's not covered by financial aid. Others will do their best to cut educational costs by living at home, getting extra roommates, reducing their grocery budget, dropping a course, etc. And for some, this unmet need may ultimately be the barrier that prevents them from completing their studies. Next slide. The latest addition to the financial aid report is the section on student loan debt. Senate Bill 1019 by Senator Zaffarini was passed during the 87th legislation and it directed the agency to include a breakout of student loan data disaggregated across several categories. We acknowledge in our report that the data is not comprehensive. For example, our financial aid database doesn't collect data for any portion of the higher education that a student pursues out of state or at a for-profit institution. But despite these limitations, the new requirement enhances the picture painted by the financial aid report through charts and figures that explain how aggregate borrowing is broken down across race, ethnicity, gender, degree type, enrollment status and graduation status. And at its broadest level, it provides the data element that everyone is always very interested in seeing, which is the average debt level. It also tells a story. Next slide. It tells us that most students do not take on student loans. But it goes deeper to explain that story and that the story is very different depending on the institution you attend, since the low rates of borrowing at two-year institutions are the reason that our overall rates of borrowing look so low. And it tells less positive parts of the story like the fact that almost 60% of students who left a four-year institution before attaining a degree have student debt that they will need to begin repaying despite not having the typical boost in income that comes with completing the credential. Next slide. Thank you for allowing me the time to share with you some background on our annual financial aid report. With a report that logs in at over 100 pages, my six slides barely scratch the surface, um, but I hope I provided a, hope, a helpful overview for you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So it's interesting that, uh, did I see that right, 56% of the students uh, don't seek financial aid? They 56% um, don't graduate with um, loans. So they may have received other financial aid, um, but they, when they graduate, they have not incurred any loans. Got it. So, um, is there a way? And I noticed, and I recall you mentioning that we're not able to track any out-of-state mm -hmm. loans or subsidies. Is there a way to any ideas on how we can track that as well from a student disclosure standpoint, or is that just tough to? That's one I'd have to think a little bit about. Um, I'm not sure the extent to which we might be able to pull in information from the And maybe it's a small enough percentage database. where it's not material. Yep. I, I don't know. Um, we'll look into that. Absolutely. But it, it seems to me that um, you know our job is to study those patterns, figure out where there are gaps, and what can we do to help institutions educate the student and their families as to resources that are available that they're not capitalizing on. So that's really where I'm headed on that. Yeah. The, uh, could I ask a question if I could? You bet. Uh, the uh, data that you showed on that last slide was from the fall of 2014. Uh, that seems to be rather dated. Do you have any updated information since then? It was for the cohort that entered in the class of 2014. Uh -huh. um, and so what we do is we track cohorts through a four, uh, six year period. Um, and then report on the activity. Um, and that's a common um, period that's used for enrollment tracking to look at graduation rates and completion rates. Thank you. I have a question for you. On the slide with the uh, average cost of attendance, mm -hmm. is that per student uh, when you go, if you would go back to 
page uh, five. I'm looking at a five here. The average cost of attendance? Yeah. Yes, that um, that's the average across okay. the sector um, for um, students attending, yes. Okay. okay. And that's the full cost of attendance, so that reflects tuition, fees, room, board, books and supplies, uh, miscellaneous expenses. So it's the full picture of the cost of attendance that can be funded through financial aid uh -huh. um, rather than the um, direct costs, which are more typically just the tuition and fees. Okay. And that's per year? Per year. Right. Okay. Yes. That's what I was going to ask. Is that per year? Yep. That's okay. per year. All right. All right. Thank you. Does that include, you mentioned before, you know, cutting back on grocery and stuff like that, getting extra roommates. Does these cost of attendance include things such as, rent, you know, renting an apartment, uh, paying for the cost of living in different areas? Yes. Uh, when an individual institution puts together a financial aid package for a student, they'll put together a cost of attendance um, that is meant to reflect um, the full cost of attendance. Um, they'll vary that cost depending on the um, options that individuals have selected. So if they're living on campus, they'll use you know, the on-campus housing or, or dining plans. If they're living off campus, then they'll make estimates for the cost of living in that um, particular area um, for what it will cost to, um, you know, for rent and utilities, um, for what groceries and the like will cost for um, feeding yourself off campus, et cetera. Gotcha. Thank you. Ms. Schwartz, did you have a question? Any other questions? I, I just have a question. This might be a tough one for you. <laughs> I recently saw a billboard of a university here in the state that said number one university in the state <laughs> with graduates with little to no debt. Can you name that university? I'm sorry, I cannot. <laughs> just, I'm just, I, I know it's a tough question. I, I didn't know that, but it, it happens to be a university in my area. So I thought, I thought that was pretty good marketing. Surprise, actually. surprise, yeah. That was that's pretty good marketing, <laughs> Excellent right? Excellent marketing. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? If not, members, is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 2020 report on student financial aid in Texas higher education, please? So moved. Thank you. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, do I have any dis any further discussion? If not, those uh, in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Hearing none, the motion passes. Item Agenda item 5G was approved on the consent calendar, so we will move on to agenda item 5H1 is consideration of the repeal of the Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 17, Subchapters A through F, I, K, and L. Uh, Ms. Emily Cormier, Assistant Commissioner for Funding, will present this item and be available to answer any questions. Morning again. This item is a full repeal of our Chapter 17 rules concerning resource planning and then a replacement with much of the same information but reorganize, reorganized for clarity. There was a few policy changes that I'll walk you through. Overall, the purpose of amending these rules was to reduce administrative burden on both the institutions and the Higher Education Coordinating Board related to facilities programs. The largest change seen throughout the rules is for institutions' capital projects. So back in 2013, the legislature repealed the requirement that the coordinating board approve capital projects and instead provided that an institution's board of regents retain that authority. Statutes still provided that we collect data on the projects, which includes things such as new construction, repair and renovation, and property purchase, but was permissive that we may continue to review the projects against certain standards. This rule change today provides that we'll no longer continue to review the projects as that effort is duplicative of what an institution and a board of regents do. And instead, we'll focus on having an accurate and streamlined reporting from in institutions to ensure that we have a good, useful data repository of capital information. We will still produce the standards that the projects were reviewed against, but now these are reframed as a tool that institutions and board of regents may use in their evaluation. While we made this larger change, we also decided to do cleanup on certain other pieces of the rules. Other changes include an update to our facilities audit process, 
So we're required by statute to perform on-site audits of general academics, state, and technical colleges to examine their space use. The rules do not fully explain how this occurs, so we've codified the existing process so institutions are clear on the requirements. And other changes in the rules include cleanup relating to energy savings performance contracts to clarify approval authority and when contract terms begin. There are also numerous updates just for organization to definitions, eliminating outdated or unnecessary information, and just generally to make the chapter easier to understand for our institutions. No public comments were received for these rules, and we did perform outreach with the system offices relating to our capital project reporting and received positive feedback on streamlining the information for our facilities programs. For this board item, the staff recommend adoption of both the repeal and then the replacement of the Chapter 17 rules. So that concludes my remarks, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So I assume this was a team effort that everybody went through these rules and vetted them and to come up with these recommendations? Yes, sir. Yeah, right. Any questions? Uh, if not, uh, members, is there a motion to approve the repeal of Chapter 17 subchapters A through F, I, K, and L, and the adoption of the new rules in Chapter 17, please? Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. 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 Thank you. Seconded. Any discussion? Uh, those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, the motion passes. Uh, agenda item six is adjournment. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn, please? I don't uh, Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, members in, in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Uh, hearing none, this uh, committee meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for your participation and hard work on this. <laughs>